So Phil, okay, we've we've talked a fair amount about your experience with tribal cultures and consciousness and and the connection you felt through through tribal societies and, and that kind of thing. And how do you think that influenced you with this interest into you know what a lot of people who don't have disorders don't even want to look at? I mean, very few people are interested in the subject of mental disorders, mental illness, so-called mental illness, without having that touch them personally. Right. You know, so how, how did it come to you? Started with the Kutin. Okay. Two years later, I was in Africa and Kenya in the Samburu tribe doing a, a story for Amnesty International. And I meet one of their predictors. That's what, that's what my guide okay. called her. Nice and position. She was a 37 year old woman um, that had five kids. I remember and when she was 14, she started hearing voices, having wild nightmares, um, having visions in the daytime, um, thought she was dying. I heard that over and over again. And, and her grandmother took her aside and told her she had a special sensitivity and somehow brought her through the initiatory process to get her meaning and what she was going through and understanding and allowed her to um, channel these energies in a way that she became this famous predictor in the Sambu tribe. So I thought, wow, that sounds similar to the Kutin. And so after that, when I would go and do my work, my human rights work, whether it was for the UN or Amnesty or an NGO like CARE, um, I would ask, who are your healers? Who are your visionaries here? So I got to interview a lot of these people. And, mm. um, and they all um, would go into an extraordinary state of consciousness by inducing it in one way or another, sometimes with plant medicine, sometimes with drums. There was a the Kalash on the Pakistan Afghan border, a little group of animists there mm -hmm. um, burn a fire and sacrifice an animal, pour the blood over the branches of juniper smoldering and the shaman inhales the smoke to go into trance. Wow. So there's different ways. The Lakota, um, they do the sun dance, which is dancing without food or water for, yeah. um, four days. And, I, and I've done that dance. Uh, we call it sun moon dance down here. Three days, no food, no water. You've done it? Yeah. Well, three days, no food. Um, and then they gave us water as a choice. And I chose to take the water. But I've done that. And the very little water. I mean, just a little cup a day. Wow. But I did it not with the Lakota, but in a new age format with a woman down here in Brazil who followed the work of a guy named Beautiful Painted Arrow, who mm. was a uh, half Spanish, half Pueblo Indian. And he brought the sun moon dance ritual out to whites. That was like his vision. Oh. And yeah, and he was kicked out of his tribe because of that. But um, mm. yeah, but uh, so yeah, I've done that four times. Whoa. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And had you mystical know, experience. Kind of Pierce as well. Oh, no, no, I didn't. Do, no, the sun dance, they pierce you. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, this dance, they didn't pierce us. But I did go into non ordinary states just due to the dancing, you know. Wow. Yeah. Uh, gentle, yeah. but but powerful. So, Sean, this brings up okay. a question. Um, <laughs> you, who yeah. have, unlike me, who have spontaneously gone into this odd, un what I like to call extraordinary state of consciousness. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, spontaneously. Sure. And so I would think that you have that tendency, right? Um, you have a tendency to much more than I do. And, um, and that doing a sun dance, you would go into that space rather easily. Versus somebody like myself. Yeah, I, th I think so. And, you know, speaking from my holotropic breathwork experience and then working on my retreats, the more you go there, 
the easier it gets. Yeah. So for example, you know, in, when I started out doing holotropic breath work, I needed about 20, 25 minutes of aggressive breathing to get into a non-ordinary state that was really therapeutic and you sort of, you're kind mm -hmm. of half here, half there. Um, but now um, I don't need to breathe. I can just be in the room and I don't need to over breathe. I can be in the room, the music starts and I'm away to the races, you know, and it starts out mild, but it can go deep just like any other session. And, and so even my work now, like, cause I'm doing distance healing for people. Yeah. I go into my room and I'm in a subtle non-ordinary state for two hours, but right. then I just, I just come out and I eat and I'll watch the Toronto Raptors play in the playoffs because I'm tribal like that. I want to see Joel Embiid cry from the <laughs> Philadelphia 76ers. I'm looking forward to it, you know, <laughs> but yeah, I can, but, but also, you know, the experiences that I have are, are quite, um, most of the t time they're pretty subtle, you know, they're, but they can be strong. Like I was in a room, I was at a conference in Greece and this guy, he had a shamanic drumming circle and he gave us a guided vision to like, okay, imagine yourself going into a forest, following a trail, going into a forest and he's drumming the whole time, right? Loud, loud drumming. And I was there participating with my wife next to me. And then in about two minutes, I was snoring and, and my wife is like, how could he possibly be snoring? The, the, the drumming is too loud to um, sleep to. Yeah. And it's only been two minutes. It's because I wasn't asleep. I was in an ordinary state. It's like yeah. the spirit just comes and sort of takes you, you know? Wow. Um, and I told him at the end, I said, I was following you for about five minutes and then I was gone. And he said, oh, that's the shamanic sleep. And after getting that name, I recognized that on my retreats, a lot of my clients go into the shamanic sleep um, oh, be a because lot of a lot sleep. of them go. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And, and like, I'm playing like loud techno music, bah, 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 mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. strong electronic music. And they're completely still completely quiet. They're, they're gone. You know, wow. they're, they're gone. So to me, what I'm doing is a lot more shamanic than it is psychological. Like it's not like Groff is rooted in psychology, but how it's manifested becomes a lot more like tribal shamanism, you know? Yeah. And, well, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that is what the initiation teaches how to go into that space and come out. And the yeah. shaman is an expert like you are of going in and coming out of that. Yeah. You know? I mean, I've got my own style, but yeah, I'm, it's pretty easy for me. Yeah. It's pretty easy. Yeah. Interesting. And, the, and you know, it's all about, you've heard about set and setting, right? Like it's all about yeah. the set and setting. Yeah. What I found is that the safer the setting, like for example, if I've got gra facilitators with me, mm. oh, then I'm going to have a, a real piece of work come my way. I mean, I can have energies come to me that are to the point where I want to kill myself, but I've got, I've got facilitators with me to help me through those tough periods. Okay. Really? Yeah. Like so energies from deeper, other clients. You go deeper with other facilitators with you to support me. Yeah. Like if I'm working on a client mm. and then I'm doing what I call surrogate breath work, I'm breathing on their behalf. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cause I've absorbed their energies. I've detected, I've absorbed their energies and it's not an uncommon thing to be able to do. It's, it's not that uncommon, but if I've got facilitators with me, I can go into like their birth process. I can go into like sex abuse things and then wow. really heavy material. Um, and you that feel the, it all. Yeah. That the client can't see or they're not ready to feel that level of material, you know, through either lack of experience or it's just too painful. Usually mm -hmm. something like that. But you can take it. Yeah. Most, well, so far, cross my fingers, right? But But if I'm doing the work at a distance in my bedroom, I don't have a facilitator with me. The experience is milder, mm. you know, mm. um, easier to digest. I don't, I don't have to like, I don't know, just be alone for four hours or something. Like I've had some, I've had some experiences working with people that really shook me up a few times, you know? Um, but usually here it's more digestible and it's like, I can make it something I can do every day, you know, for people. 
And mm. the, the intense experiences you can't do every day. They're, they're too much. Too much. I would imagine. Um, wow. After you do that and you take on all that, how do you clear it? I mean, do you, does it stay with you for the rest of the day or? A few, a few it, techniques. Uh, but the most important thing is to continue the breath work until, or for me to continue the breath work until I'm done. That's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. um, but still there will be lingering energies that usually get processed through dreams, uh, nightmares, you know, like I'll have really strong nightmares after I work with a client a lot of the time. And I can facilitate that process if I meditate. So if I meditate before I go to sleep, then the material goes through faster. You know, These nightmares are coming from your work with this client. Yeah. Yeah, it's their it's their issue that you are having a nightmare about, yeah. not yours. So, like, I had one client, um, a good example, years ago, uh, where she was dealing with a lot of fear, and I could tell because whenever we talked, she had her hands up around her neck, which is like a a thing that um, people who study this sort of thing know. People are very fearful when they protect their necks, and uh, she had some good sessions, but one night I dreamt that I was in a hotel. And that a lion chased me and my wife down a hotel corridor, grabbed my wife and dragged her down the stairs and killed her. And I ran into a hotel room and called my parents, begging them for help. Okay. Wow. So I'm not talking about just a little bit of anxiety. I mean, just freaking wow. terrifying, wow. terrifying nightmares have come my way after working with clients that I never get alone. Like if I'm working by myself or even, even my daily life, my... My dreams are, I keep, in my own life, I keep waking up in the same, ad, or in ad agencies over and over and over again and wondering why that keeps happening. So if I have an ad agency dream, I know it's not my clients, but if someone's dragging my wife or a lion is dragging my wife down a, a cor corridor of a hotel, I know that it's related to the client I've been okay. working on. Did that, did you verify that with the client to see if that ever happened to them or if they had had those dreams? Uh, this particular How did it client, to the client, that lion story. In well, in this particular case, I didn't even share it because uh, the client was very uh, disconnected from their feelings. So you need mm. to be careful with what you share. You know? mm. um, but another lion story, and this happened just yesterday. I'm, I'm working with a distance healing. I'm doing distance healing with a guy, mm. and sometimes what comes to me, I get a lot of negative energy, but Sometimes what comes to me is just visions and the visions are not really therapeutic in nature. They just let the client know that we're connected. You know? So what I saw was a, a statue of a lion, the kind that would be like in front of a mansion, you know, like oh, two yeah. lions protecting mm -hmm. the entrance, this kind of mm -hmm. thing. And uh, this particular client told me not only did he frequently take pictures of sort of lions at the entrance, on many of his uh, trips, his travel journeys, mm -hmm. wherever he went, because he was a big fan of them. But him and his mother actually bought a lion and put it in front of their mobile home. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the opposite of the big mansion, you know, just the trailer with the two plastic lions in the front, you know, this kind of thing. Um, so when when links like that happen, where like mm -hmm. I'll get a vision of this lion and the guy says, well, I actually bought one and put it in front of his mobile home. It's like it's a it's a synchronistic relationship. So uncanny that the client knows that I'm picking up their material. Yeah. Was, you know, and, you know, it's not always like that, but it's frequently, you know, I've I've had visions of people and then uh, the clients have sent me the photo of the person that I was referring to. And I don't mm. know who that person is, you know, mm. and, and, and I was never a person who considered myself psychic. It's from going into these processes mm. where you get in touch with this quantum dimension, we call it today. Mm -hmm. But I, but I think it's the same dimension that the tribal shamans are in touch with. Yeah. And I think it's the same dimension that people are sort of floating around in when they go into acute psychosis. I think it's all the same, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's like that old, uh, Joseph Campbell quote, you know, the, the shaman is swimming where the schizophrenic is drowning. You, yeah. You've heard that before. In the same water. In the, the same water. Yeah. Yeah. That kind of thing. 
But anyways, yeah, back back well, to you a little bit. Say we're all totally connected in some level. Sure, and it's it's also why when I work with people, I don't see them as having a mental illness. I just see them as having sort of gone into these sort of strange realms that I've already visited, and they just need some help in sort of working through what's there, you know, mm-hmm. working through what's there. Mm-hmm. So again, you know, very very shamanic in, in yeah. nature. Interesting. Wow. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, for you to explore this. I would imagine for you, you had this episode, you said in... Two, in a, 96. A 96, yeah. Yeah, or so, 97. Yeah. So that's almost, what, 30 years ago. Yeah, right. a long time ago. And so it's brought you to this, where you are now. So yeah. in that way, would you consider it a blessing? Oh, for me, it was the most pivotal pivotal experience of my life. There's no mm-hmm. doubt about it. Changed the direction of my life entirely. I wouldn't be in Brazil. Uh, you know, I wouldn't be married to Leisure. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't be studying this work. I wouldn't be doing any of this if it wasn't for that particular experience. Yeah. You know, so biggest blessing of my life. It's certainly up there. Yeah. You know, and before that, I was dealing with depression on and off again for about seven years. Um, you, feeling you have to deal with that now. If I get stuck, if I get stuck, um, sometimes there's just deeper work that needs to be done or deeper decisions that need to be made that I'm really not going in the direction I need to be going. And then it's like, come on, do that thing you're afraid to do, you know? Mm. But if I go, if I get into a space where I'm feeling depressed, then it's like I get really introspective. It's like, okay, this is all about me. It's not about what's going on out there. Mm. And I work on myself and I try and make the decisions necessary to move forward, you know, to find that energy, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, part of finding the energy was starting a podcast this year. I right. felt like I needed to come back to the internet world and in a sense share what I've been learning doing retreats for seven years and, and my yeah. experience, you know, and introducing people to people like yourself who've, who've made a significant contribution and who bring a really unique perspective. Mm-hmm. You know? Great. Wonderful. Yeah. 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 So, it is yeah. pushing yourself through those fears, right? The, oh yeah. If you get yeah. too comfortable, that's what I, I'm semi thinking I'm doing now. I'm writing my memoir a little bit. Are you getting too comfortable? How old are you, Phil? Come on. <laughs> I'll be 80 in December. I think you're allowed to be comfortable. <laughs> you're 80. Take, Take a break. <laughs> <laughs> the Sahara Desert can wait. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I don't know. Um, I, I think, you know, I'd like to put out some of my experiences, what I've learned type of stories. Right, right. And I think that could be helpful to some people. But, you know, um, to me, it also has this um, uh, tinge, I would say, of self-indulgence. You know, it's like, okay, um, how much, you know, I've, I've, I've had a lot of my life that I've done things out of curiosity a lot, but also out of need for admiration and respect and, and uh, that sort of thing. And I now question myself when I go to do something, how much is that trying to feed my need for admiration, respect? Yeah, sure, sure. Approval. And um, so that's what I'm wondering about in staying at home. <laughs> I don't miss the travel that much. Everybody asked me that. Um, I've been, you know, since the pandemic, just been grounded here. Um, but I'm in a beautiful place and I love my life here. And, but um, I, I, yeah, I'm still making peace with doing this. I don't even like to call it a memoir. I just want to, I just want to get better at writing, basically. Sure. Well, I think just the fact that you ask yourself the question 
so, sort of gives you an answer that, you know, you, you're, I'm sure you're coming from a, a humble place. You know, you're not Donald Trump trying to, you know, show the world how great he is. Um, you know, and, and don't confuse, this is something from Ken Wilber. Sometimes we confuse a big ego with a big soul. Mm. You got a big soul. You got big stories to tell. You've had big adventures. You've had an incredible life, really. I mean, really unique experiences you've had. And you can take amazing photos. Um, so there's there's a lot for you to share. And, and I think that if you share your work, it inspires other people to get out of that cubicle, you know, to go and, and, and take the risks that they need to live their life. Because you've, you've taken risks that have, have taken you out of your comfort zone, you know. And, and I think that even though we talk about it a lot, I still don't see that much movement from most people out of their comfort zone. You know, they only get out of their comfort zone enough to take an Instagram photo and then they crawl right back in. That's what I see, you know, but really putting it on the line. Not so much. Mm. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I had to hire you as my PR agent. <laughs> you should, you should. I'm your biggest fan. <laughs> <laughs> and vice yeah. versa, Sean. Yeah. 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 Thank you. I Thank mean, you. what you've done to help so many people, I mean, Quite frankly, all the work I did, all the books on Tibet and the issues around women's empowerment and all that, I think Crazy Wise has impacted more people than all the other stuff. China's still in Tibet. <laughs> that didn't okay. change anything. Uh, um, but anyway... Um, just having, I, you must get this. I mean, having people just contact you is thank you. You know, you gave me a perspective that save, uh, sometimes they'll say saved my life. Yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah, I had I a mean, lot of thank yous over the years. Can, I mean, we're totally lucky in that respect mm -hmm. to have, have um, for me, just stumbled into this world. And, and which has become my own spiritual journey. To, How so? Oh, just my inner search. I, you know, I can be very outer directed into the outer world and not really look inside like I, I have been. Um, from being around people that have had to look inside very, you know, strongly. And um, uh, and being inspired by that mm -hmm. to do it. What made you finally pick up your camera and start to make this movie? So I, I, I ended up interviewing all these healers and visionaries around the world and hearing this similar story of how they were selected. And then meeting a kid here in Seattle I was doing, I was going to do this little film on meditation because I'd started meditating. I thought, well, I'll just do a, a simple film, just ask people what they're getting out of it, what experiences they're having, what difficulties, so on and so forth. And the third person, I paired, a, a woman that I paired up with was kind of acting like a line producer. And when I was back in town from my trips, she'd have people... Um, that she lined up for uh, us to interview together. And the third person was Adam, who was the main person in our film. And he had had his break at 20, you know, medicated on 15 pills a day for four years and having all sorts of side effects. Cut it off, cold turkey. And he was so frustrated with it that he cut off all his meds at once, which is extremely dangerous to do, and did a Vipassana meditation retreat. <laughs> 10 hours, 10 days, silent meditation, like 12 to 14 hours a day meditating. And that settled him out. It was a miracle. And that gave me enough interest to start following him. 
And that became, I followed that story for six years to create the film. We did, our team did. And um, yeah, that's how I got into it. <laughs> All right. And you had another woman you were following. I can't remember her yeah, name. Arkaya. Arkaya. Yeah. So yeah. as we were starting the film, we were posting, you know, we, I had a great digital communications person, Sandy, in our office. And she was posting all our interviews with experts and, and the things we were investigating while we started this film. Mm -hmm. And um, Akaya, who had had a severe break when uh, it was living back in New York, and she called us and said, this is what's happened. I found a peer respite center where a group of people were like, like me and could, we could share our stories and it helped me so much. And then she said, I met a South African Sangoma, which is a shaman. And mm -hmm. she has her lineage is South African. And she happened to meet this woman who lived in Baltimore that was a Sangoma, a shaman. Mm, and okay. she started her initiation. And I thought, wow, you know, here's somebody just starting this initiation. We can follow her as she attempts to heal herself. Okay. And her story is fantastic. I mean, she went through the initiation. She healed from her childhood sexual abuse. And um, now she has a full clientele of people, much like you, helping oh, people. really? Working as a therapist? Process. And yeah. she lectures all over the world. I mean, wow. just totally changed her life from being totally um, suicidal to her life now. Did the Crazy Mize Wise movie get into her healing of the abuse issue? Um, I can't remember. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we filmed as much of the initiation as we could. The Sangoma was very protective of that. And okay. what appears in the film, what she said is going through that initiation was very difficult. It was almost harder than going through the actual experiences she had. Um, she said, I had to face all my fears. Again, I can almost quote it. I've seen the movies. So face all my fears, be with those fears, um, uh, address all the people I've hurt. She left her family during her mm. deepest depression. She had three kids. Um, it was almost like a 12 step mm -hmm. um, procedure. I don't know the okay. 12 steps that well, but, you know, make amends face, um, surrender. I had totally surrender myself, surrender to a higher power. So yeah, those were kind of the ingredients that she had. And she said it was very, very difficult. And, and it took her a year and a half. The, her initiation was a year and a half. Yeah. Could you, could you, uh, introduce me? <laughs> I haven't met her yet. Uh, yeah. Do you want do you want to talk with her? Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love yeah, to. Kaya. Yeah, she'd love to yeah. be on she'd love to be on your podcast. Okay, ter terrific. I would think. Terrific. I haven't yeah. talked to her for a little while. Yeah. But both and in both of those cases uh, with Akaya and Adam, mm -hmm. they had really strong spiritual components and they were both abused, right? Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. I've gotten criticism on the film. He said, you selected two people that had childhood sexual abuse. I didn't even know it going into it <laughs> about Adam's sexual abuse. Or why, why would you be criticized for that? Well, they said it's too much about sexual abuse. You, mean, I, you know, when you make a film, you're going to get crit criticized. Sure. for. Some people said uh, there's too much shamanism in this. Um, yeah. Uh, psychiatrists have said that. So um, anyway, the film is what it turned out to be. It wasn't like I was selecting things. Okay. 
Okay. Other than I selected yeah. her because she was going through a shamanic process. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I guess I was thinking that maybe you had somebody telling you, well, this person doesn't have a typical disorder because they were sexually abused. Like, you know, but that didn't happen. It was just that both were abused and they thought that was too much focus on that. Right. Yeah, yeah it was. It was. Like it was like everybody that has these problems has been sexually abused. And that is oh. the case. No, it's not the case, but I'll be doing a podcast soon about the prevalence. And I can tell you it is a lot more prevalent than I imagined when I started getting into this work. Oh yeah. Yeah. And it is very complex territory because there are things like blocked memories. Yeah. Um, where people don't remember what happened to them. But then when they go, they're in a manic episode, they have these feelings come up and they start blaming certain people around them for abusing them. And, and you, and often it's not the person that they're pointing to that abused them, but it was somebody else, or it seems to have been somebody else. But, you know, I think um, I, I've read some data, at least 50% of people with a disorder have been sexually abused. Wow. I mean, you know, wow. uh, and you and that, definitely for women uh, and for men, it's it's would be more than you would think. You know, like I've had four male clients who were in boarding schools and mm. we know that boarding schools are rampant with sex abuse you mm. know? Um, from teachers to students, excuse yeah. me, from teachers to students, but also students on students, you know. Yeah. Um, so. It's a it's a big territory that is not touched upon, and, and I'm really glad that you brought it up in your movie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it just happened. I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't going out looking for it. Yeah, and I remember when we first met, and you weren't so keen to jump on the spiritual dimension of these disorders, and and you didn't even want to use the word, and I kept kind of leaning in on you, like, "Come on, Phil." Phil, come on, come on, buddy. It's like we think we're dead. We think we're we think we're Jesus. We think we're gonna be here to save the world. Like everything that's happening to us is spiritual in nature. It's got to be said. And and then when I saw the movie came out, I was like, oh, I think Phil was listening a little bit. I think there's a little <laughs> bit of a well, uh, I, I had in there. saying I didn't go far enough, and and I wish I had have gone further into. Um, the spirituality and make more a, a statement. I mean, first of all, you have to define that term. How do you define the word spirituality? Oh, sure, sure, sure. And because it, it raises different issues to different people. Uh, and wow. for me, it is um, a state of being um, super connected profoundly connected to everyone and everything um, is and being a part of something that's larger than what you think yourself is. So, mm -hmm. well, I think those are important aspects of it. There's, there's no doubt about it, but you know, when we started, because we, we spoke at the first crazy wise conference together, we were kind of the headliners and yeah. we named the conference after your movie. And the, by the way, this conference uh, was in the Netherlands in Rotterdam, and they they've still got it going seven years in a row. This, this conference, yeah, it's still going. But at the time, I was the only one of all the speakers talking about the spiritual dimension of these disorders. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. And, and and the same year, I was at a transpersonal conference in Greece with my mm. wife. Same trip, and again, okay, transpersonal psychology conference. It's all spiritual. I was the only one talking about mental disorders at the spiritual, at a transpersonal wow. conference. Wow. You know, we said we, we, we did a word search on um, all the different speakers and who was bringing up keywords like mental disorder, mental illness, bipolar, schizophrenia, schizoaffective, any of that stuff. And it was just my wife and myself. And that was it in this whole conference. Um, and now it's changed. It's, it's different. Changed. So it's changed. John, how, how do you define the word spirituality? Are the concept of spirituality? Uh, oh, it's pretty tough because, like you said, it means different things to different people. What and does a it lot mean of, to you, though? For me, okay. 
Well, I would say that I, I consider myself a spiritual person in the sense that I recognize that every person, whether they believe it or not, whether they're Christian, Jewish, Muslim, whether they're atheist, agnostic, whether they're in a tribe or in the city, uh, whether they're killing thousands of people or they're trying to save the planet, everybody has a spiritual dimension. The spiritual dimension isn't necessarily good or bad the same way our physical dimension is not necessarily good or bad. It's just there, you know? So that spiritual dimension is there. It operates in a quantum style, like synchronicities can come into place when you're following your heart that don't follow linear logic. You know, it's, it's not a rational orientation. When you're coming from a spiritual place, you're not really operating rationally. You're coming from a deeper intuition. And as opposed to impulse, where like, oh my God, I'm, I'm seeing this gorgeous woman and I want to touch her and I want to taste her and I want to have sex with her. You know, this is all very impulsive. I see this, this guy that's really bothering me and he's saying bad words and I just want to kill him. I want to punch him in the face. You know, these are impulsive feelings. Intuition is like the opposite. It's like an annoying whisper that just will not leave you alone until you surrender to what it's got to share, you know? Yeah. And that means things like I'm going to spend money. I don't have to take a trip that I probably shouldn't be going on, but I keep dreaming about this place every night. And so I'm going to go, you know, mm -hmm. Um, I, I don't know why I'm spending an hour and 45 minutes on an interview when I know that the average listener on YouTube is probably going to listen for about 15 minutes, but, <laughs> but it's like, there's something more going on than views and likes and money. It's about connection and following that intuition and following that intuition and having faith that something bigger is going to come out or something, I don't want to say bigger, but divine is going to unfold out of honoring that spirit. You know, mm -hmm. you might put it that way, That there you go. You've just got my definition. I've never thought about it before, but mm -hmm. something like that, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I really try and, you know, trust the flow. Force. Yeah. Force. What does this healing field want? You know, that's my guiding question. What does this healing field want from me? Does it want me to finish my book? Does it want me to be working with people? Does it, you know, mm -hmm. um, does it want me to stay up all night with my this cat that lives outside? Um, you know, just follow that feeling. And, you know, my, my, my wife thinks that I live in the moment more than perhaps anybody she knows. Mm. You know? wow. um, and, and is yeah. that a spiritual... Um, dimension as well to be in the moment being uh i think that if you feel like you're present to what's mm -hmm. going on yeah then yeah you're in the moment yeah mm -hmm. yeah and then and then you're kind of aligned i see it as sort of being aligned mm -hmm. so like i said even though we've been talking for almost two hours it's gone by like that you know mm -hmm. i can be in an interview with another person and perhaps the, I've been talking to them for five minutes and that five minutes feels like two hours. You know, when, when time slows down, uh, I think a lot of times we're not aligned with where we're really, what we're mm. really supposed to be doing, where things are supposed to be going, mm. you know? And I worked with a girl with schizophrenia. She was in India and she told me, she said, time is moving slower than a drop of water leaving my hand. Just wow. like, and it was like she was so lonely and so disconnected mm. from her from everything in her family. And she was just in a state of permanent hell. You wow. know, her life was just one hellish second after another, and every second felt like an hour. Yeah. You know, I've heard several people diagnosed with bipolar that say mm. th that sometimes uh three minutes seems like all day and sometimes um, all day seems like three minutes. They get both. Well, it's um, time there's distorts. A few, there's a few things that are going on. Yeah, 
and speaking from my own experience in mania or acute psychosis, a spiritual thing, you can really lose all sense of time when you're in that. It's not quite the same as what I'm talking about because I'm talking about a grounded state, you know, mm. where your, your rational mind might be saying, wow, this is a long interview, but your heart is going, shut up. This is really fun. I'm having fun, <laughs> you know. <laughs> You know, but when you're in a manic state, yeah, your your sense of time can really go in and out and around and around. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. I had a situation where I was actually in front of a watch store in a shopping mall, and I was staring at the second hands, thinking that I could stop time with my mind, and I was convinced that by focusing on it, I was actually stopping the second hands. I was there focusing on them, trying to make that move. You know. So yeah, time is a is a mystery for sure. But when you're when you're grounded and you're on purpose, time should move quickly. You know, mm. time should generally move quickly. Mm. If if time's moving slowly, probably something's off. Well, I'll tell you one thing about getting older. It goes faster and faster. And all my my parents, my grandparents, everybody told me that, but I sure know it now. I mean, you a can week really feel it like huh? that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I feel sorry. it accelerating for sure, for sure. Yeah. yeah, a lot more fun. Well, I think we're, this kind of feels like the end. Are we at the end? Uh, yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll just finish by, you know, saying thanks so much for donating again, so much for your time to my projects like you've done in the past. Very much appreciated. And it's been terrific. And I've learned lots about you here on our call that I didn't know uh, from before. So it was great. <laughs> and vice versa, Sean. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. And thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. All right. Thanks. Okay. See you later. All right.